Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the Sewist and Quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Justine Seymour, an award-winning and much-in-demand costume designer whose latest work can be seen on Women of the Movement, the limited series about civil rights leader Mimi Till, currently airing on ABC. Born in the United Kingdom, Justine attended Michael Hall School, a Waldorf school in the UK focusing on arts and language. At 16, she began her first career as a model. From there, she collaborated with musicians on costumes for their stage performances, and that led to more performance art costumes for artists, plays, and TV commercials in London throughout the 1980s and early 90s. In addition, she earned her master's degree in design at the Australian Film, Television, and Radio School. Seymour designed the wardrobe for the Apple TV Plus adaptation of The Mosquito Coast, Her award-winning costume design in the Netflix hit miniseries Unorthodox was nominated for an Emmy and won the German TV Award for Best Costume Designer, as well as earning a nomination for the Costume Designers Guild Award for Excellence in Contemporary TV. While in Sydney, Justine worked as a member of the art department on major films including Mission Impossible 2, Moulin Rouge, Star Wars Attack of the Clones, and Son of the Mask. She's also worked on independent film projects, The Session, Backtrack, All Nighter, and Destination Wedding. She's designed episodic TV shows for various networks, including Netflix, Messiah, and Medal of Honor, TNT's I Am The Night, and Amazon Studios' One Mississippi. Now based in Los Angeles, Justine is widely admired for her ability to authentically build character through costume. Hello, Justine, and welcome to So-and-So. Hi, Meg. Thanks so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. It is wonderful. You know, you've, you're incredibly accomplished, and in sharing your biography, it's obvious that you've done quite a lot, but, but let's go back to the beginning of, of what you do. Why and how did you learn to sew? Well, I'm one of those really lucky ones, and I'm sure lots of your listeners are going to go, yes, that's me too, that's me too. <laughs> I... I um, had these fabulous uh, grandmothers um, who both could sew really well, but I naturally could sew as well. And um, I started sewing uh, probably about the age of four. My mother had given me a little sewing machine that had a little hand wheel that you sewed on the side. And when I realized that that needle went in and came out and went in again and created a stitch, I just I thought that was magic. Magic. It was magic. And I thought, I can do so much with this. And um, it just ignited my imagination. And I guess I sort of, I must have asked for help from my grandmothers because um, my paternal grandmother definitely helped me make clothes for my dolls. Mm -hmm. And my maternal grandmother did this uh, very brilliant thing one day. I had spilt some hot chocolate on a really lovely little white dress that I had and it couldn't come out, was stained. And the next time I saw my little white dress, she would put these very clever strategic little patches, but she would put them all over the dress to make it look like it had always been like that, but covered the hot chocolate, Mm -hmm. which then made me realize how ingenious it could be as a tool. So that was sort of what started me. Now, do you remember the first piece that you sewed? Uh, Oh, now that I'm thinking about it, I think it was a two-dimensional square (laughs) that I sewed at the shoulders and under the arms for a Barbie doll. And I must have, I must have literally been about four or five. Oh my goodness. But uh, that it's a very faint memory, but I have made so many items in my life um, that I, you know, I can't, I can't remember all of them. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I went back to England to see my, my best friend, Sonny, mm-hmm. and uh, I hadn't seen her for years. And she said, Oh, come on, come over here, Justine, come over here. And she opened a closet 
And there were all these clothes that I'd made her in the 80s. Oh, my. Yeah, and she's just <laughs> like, I keep them just because they're so fabulous. And sometimes I still wear them. But they were, they, you know, they were very 1980s dots and things and big collars and shoulders. And But, yeah, there was a closet full of my work. That's, you know, fashion comes back around. So maybe mm -hmm. she's outfitted for the future. <laughs> exactly. Justine, you attended a Waldorf school. and. The schools have a 100-year-old philosophy that the learning process is essentially threefold, engaging head, heart, and hands, or thinking, feeling, and doing. Can you talk a little bit about how this education perhaps influenced your creative process today? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, Rudolf Steiner had created the schooling system, and my mother was very uh, left of field um, in the 70s which is when I um, started school. And we went to Michael Hall in Forest Row. And um, before you start any academic career in, in the Wardle School, you use your hands, you use language and art and music and movement to develop um, your senses. And one of the things that we started doing very early on was um, sewing. Mm -hmm. And it was just something as I said before that I was just a complete natural at and as soon as I put a needle to a piece of fabric it just came together and um yeah it was just uh, amazing and it, it it really taught me all the basics of how to do handwork we of course we didn't use machines at all because they're everything's all about you know the craft mm -hmm. so I really learned the craft from the age of sort of six till ten um sewing by hand um and we did woodwork and metalwork and all sorts of other things and I do think that that influenced me because I am able to sort of find solutions particularly in my career today um by thinking outside the box and really thinking of how you can create something with with a base knowledge that's innate now because I was so young when when I learned all those things so it was fantastic for me Although I might just put a disclaimer there and say, I cannot spell. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, love the Wardle School, but that was something it did not manage to teach me. <laughs> ah, but you can sew. <laughs> but I can sew. <laughs> you can sew. <laughs> Justine, early on you were a model. So uh, I'd love it if you'd tell us about this part of your career and how it led to your costuming for artist plays and TV commercials throughout the 80s and early 90s. Well, it actually played a really um, important role in my sewing career, to be honest. Um, I was working as a model in New York, and um, I wasn't terribly successful. I had a couple of, you know, really fantastic months. And then um, it was winter, and the work had sort of dried up, and I went to the showrooms to, you know, because they needed fit models, because I was... Um, a really good size for sample sizes. Mm -hmm. And I would literally stand there all day, terribly boring, and have some of the best tailors in the world um, pin clothing onto my body, do alterations, and basically um, make clothing by hanging, by by hanging fabric on me and just cutting away what they didn't like. And wow. so just drapery, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched them and I was like, this is easy. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, <laughs> because you cut? could sew. <laughs> because I could sew. But I hadn't really become a, a, a very talented sewer at that point. I could sew and I understood it. But, I, I, you know, and I had, you know, I'd made shirts for my dad and, and dressing gowns. And I'd done all that. But this was drapery. This was like bias cut, amazing gowns. This was... This was really delicate stuff. Um, and I would have these tailors that came from all over the world, um, you know, hustling and bustling around me as I just learned through observing them. And um, I'm a very good fitter now. Like, I mean, I wouldn't be a fit model myself. But now when I work with my cast, I know exactly how to make an item fit their body really beautifully. And I think that that was why... Um, unorthodox, which uh, 
you had mentioned earlier. Sorry, I'm jumping mm-hmm. back to where the, no, please. the audience haven't heard. But um, I, I didn't have any money on that show. So I bought all these secondhand clothes from lots of secondhand shops. And then I just recut them and I fit them to the cast. And of course, it looks fantastic because it looks like it's made to measure, uh, which it is really. Mm-hmm. But that's how I learned it from from being a fit model back in the 80s. Um, and then the next part of your question, I moved um, back to England after being in, in America for a while. And um, my first husband actually was a musician and a DJ and needed lots of crazy clothes. So mm-hmm. I made all of his stage clothes just because it was so much fun. And he basically would wear anything I made him, including a lilac suit made out of corduroy. Nice. Um, <laughs> nice. Know, that is right. 80s, 90s, <laughs> <Right>. for sure. <laughs> and um, and then the Guardian newspaper saw, you know, saw him and then a story got written about him. And then, of course, I was mentioned. And then it just sort of snowballed like that. And, and the, that sort of thing happened in the 80s. You did literally get spotted. Um, so that's what happened. You know, um, I, I want to talk about some of the other features that you did costuming for. You mentioned unorthodox, mm. and you recently did costume design for two features about some pretty strong women. Mm-hmm. Uh, women of the Movement follows Mamie Till in her fight for civil rights uh, after her son Emmett was brutally murdered. And True Spirit, which is based on Australian Jessica Watson's memoir, about her journey as the youngest person ever to sail solo nonstop around the world unassisted. That's pretty amazing. Mm. So how did these women's stories of strength and survival inspire your creations for these features? Um, Very differently for each story, but with um, Mamie Till, which is actually a TV series. There are six episodes and it's on Hulu and um, Amazon and ABC. Um, So Mamie, her her son got brutally lynched in the south and they she lived with him in chicago um she utilized his murder by allowing the press to take photographs of his very um his very beaten body mm-hmm. and then she let them publish it so that everyone could see how disgusting the behavior had been to to murder her son in such a way and instead of sort of just going, oh, you know, covering it up and just having a beautiful ceremony and putting him, um, laying him to rest, she she took the bull by the horn, so to speak, and and shook America and America's history mm-hmm. and launched the civil rights movement uh, along with um, a group of other people who, who then went on to do much more and continue it. But um, she was so strong she was very religious and I think that that really helped her um but out of respect for her and her story I wanted to make sure that I actually um recreated all of the clothing that she wore and because there's so much publicity on what happened in that time I was able to do a ton of research and find really fantastic images of what she was wearing and then do detailed drawings and my tailor and I um, got together and of course I I chose all the fabrics and put it all together and then my tailor went and did her magic to create the clothing. Um, But it really was a celebration of Mamie Till and the strength that she had to go through with um, showing her son and then and then just standing up to the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacists who had who had committed this crime, mm-hmm. and then um, the Jessica Watson story was was very different. It was uh, basically she is a fantastic. I've met her. Um, she's a fantastic young woman who was very very headstrong, and she read a book and decided that if a boy could sail around the world, then she could too. And she wanted to break his record. I think he was 17. I think his name was mm-hmm. Jesse. I can't quite remember. And um, her name's, no, his name couldn't have been Jesse if her name was Jessica. I mean, I'm getting it confused. But um, she told her parents 
I think when she was 15 that she was going to do this. And they were like, yes, yes, dear, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that conversation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, she actually got sponsored by Ella Bache, which is an Australian skincare line. And she utilized the sailing community where she grew up in um, Queensland. And a whole heap of them just got together and they rebuilt a boat that I think maybe had been donated. Oh, sorry. I've got my head in another story, so I can't quite remember all the details. Um, But they rebuilt the boat and the Australian government wanted to stop her from sailing around the world because of, you know, she was a, a child, basically. Sure. And they had a deadline to get her out of the harbor before. Um, the court order could come through so they did that so I mean I was looking at all the imagery of her as a young woman and you know as a teenager basically and I wanted to recreate what she had worn but also it had to be very practical because she was sailing around the world and she could very easily get sunburned or windburned or cold or hot or whatever it was so I had to take in all of the practical aspects of her sailing um, to tell the story. And of course, going around the world, she went through many different um, weather scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I had to, you know, make sure that it was realistic that that what she wore in those scenarios would would also um, ring true for the sailing community that will watch the feature. So how long does it take you from uh, inception of the costuming to the actual fitting and uh, the the filming aspect. Is is there a, a usual time frame that something like this takes? Um, it, it really depends on aspects such as, is it a period show? Is it, um, you know, or, or contemporary? Um, is, is it very specific to... Um, information like uh, does it have a lot of medical background or does it have a lot of technical background like sailing or um the show that i'm on at the moment is set in the just in the late 40s just as the war is really taking hold of europe so i have to do a lot of research um you know silly things that people wouldn't even think of like are stockings available at that point you know do do women did women bother wearing gloves because it was a very hat and glove time, um, and and just silly details about you know could they actually get the stockings in Marseille because we our story is set in Marseille, um, so I have to go into really really strange practical details, um, and so to answer your question on this TV show which has got uh, seven episodes I had twelve weeks pre production on um true spirit which is a feature film i think i had i think i had nine weeks Mm -hmm. um so it really depends on yeah it really depends on the job well let's let's go a little deeper into your general creative process because we have sewists listening Mm -hmm. and and they're going to want to know how do you do what you do from your inspiration to production? If you can kind of take us through your process and then share with us what inspires you overall in your work. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, That's an so, easy question, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 well, it is becoming more fine-tuned, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, Well, what happens is in my line of work is that I will – get a script and I'm, I'm never given the job. They always have to interview four or five designers. Mm -hmm. So I get the script. I read, obviously read what I can. If it's a TV show, you usually only get the pilot. Um, so you don't really get to see what the story arc of the characters is. So, Mm -hmm. um, anyway, you glean all the information you can from the script and then, You go crazily and put a presentation together um, Mm -hmm. with research and characters and you you kind of make it up and you and I even cast it myself. So I sort of think, oh, who would that be? And then and then I'll use images of that person and and I I work very much on emotion. 
and um, sort of a, a subliminal psychology, I would have, I suppose you could call it. Um, I think about what that person's upbringing is. I think about if they're extrovert or introvert. I think about their sexuality and if they are happy to be, um, you know, overt with their sexuality or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I think about all the sorts of things that might make up um, what, what, what really brings a human to be who they are. And then I try and find ways to communicate that. And then I'll feed that into my presentation. So then I do my big, huge presentation and then have a couple of weeks of nail biting or waiting to find <laughs> out whether or not they <laughs> <Sure>. liked it. <laughs> um, and if I get the job, um, I then ask if I hit the nail on the head and if I should continue with in the direction I was going. And most of the time it is a yes. Mm -hmm. um, so then I'll just go much deeper into the characters and I always take my number one, um, the character who is leading the story. Um, and I design them first using a color palette for mood and tone and emotion. And then I design all the other characters around that character so that I don't, you know, get on set one day and go, oh, my goodness, everybody's in a white T-shirt and blue jeans. <laughs> <laughs> because trust me, that so easily can happen. Uh, sure, sure. So I'm I'm very, very strategic in the way that I map it out. It's quite mathematical because um, films are enormous and TV shows are even more enormous. Like at the moment, I've got 90 cast and um, – I think I've got 2,000 extras. And I have to make sure that the color palette for each location and um, emotional setting uh, assists the audience in understanding what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that that's basically my process. Um, but once I really hone in on a character, I look for what I call the treasures. I look for the things, the little secrets that will uh, show the audience who that person is. And for instance, one of my characters is um, he always wears French cuffs with cufflinks. And that, that to me, will explain to the audience that he's quite pedantic, that mm -hmm. he's very detail orientated. He always wears a beautiful tie with a tie pin. Like he is meticulously dressed. And his character, he's a lawyer and his character is meticulous and doesn't like to, um, you know, stray from the path. Whereas the female character is very flamboyant. And um, so the treasures that I have for her are beautiful belt buckles, um, very lovely shoes. And then um, when she drives her Rolls, uh, she doesn't have a Rolls Royce, she has a Mercedes. When she drives her Mercedes, she's got really fabulous vintage gl driving gloves. And it's it's things like that that show slightly decadent, but also playful. Um, so that, that's how I do it. I make up the story of who they are. <laughs> do do actors ever ask to have a say in, in their uh, costumes or to have a little embellishment that's special to them? Oh, absolutely, they do. And I, I really rejoice um, including them in the process. And so my what I usually do with the actors is once I've got the contact, I'll send them my little presentation and say, this is the direction I'm thinking of going um, for these reasons. Um, but if you've got something you want to add or let's just open up the dialogue and nut it out together, um, some actors are just like, no, no, you just dress me. That's fine. That's your job. And I'll find the character with you in the fitting room. And others are like, oh, yes, I was just wondering, could I have this? And do you think a walking stick or should I wear long socks or, you know, and they'll they'll add their own bits. And if um, if I think that it it assists the character, um, of course, I'll include it. And if I feel that it actually is going away from the direction of of where the narrative of the story is and the story arc that I'm taking it on, I will very gently try and um, explain why I would prefer do something other than what they've suggested. Sure. <laughs> Which can be a bit tricky. 
<laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about when you were in uh, grad school. Now, you uh, earned your master's degree, as we mentioned earlier, uh, in design at the Australian Film, Television, and Radio School. And while you were in Sydney in school, you worked as a, a member of the art department on major films. Um, so I'm curious, what did it take for you to get hired on these films while you were in school? And then the fun question, do you have any favorite stories of costuming adventures? <laughs> well, um, the, the irony is that I, even though I was studying as a costume designer, and I was the only costume designer in the film school, so I could you know, choose any of the student films to work on, which was magnificent. Um, I actually worked in the art department because um, – uh, they they needed people to work there, but I also was studying how to do aging and dyeing of fabrics. Um, mm -hmm. And um, a dear friend of mine called Genevieve was working in um, on on Moulin Rouge actually in the soft furnishing department. And because I can sew and I can make bedding and cushions and uh, curtains and whatever you whatever you want, so she hired me to come and help. Um, during the Christmas um, break, because it's summer, obviously, in Australia at Christmas time. So I had a nice long, like a three-month break, I think, and I really needed a job because I was a single mum with two kids. Um, so I went into the into work with Genevieve in the art department for soft furnishings, and, and I built all the soft furnishings in the Duke's house. I don't, have you seen Moulin Rouge? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So where um, Nicole Kidman um, has her rather nasty episode with the Duke, so all the bedding that she's laying on and all the, uh -huh. the raven, raven feather pillows and all of that, I made all of that. Um, and I actually worked with Genevieve to, to dye those, those beautiful satins and velvets into the fantastic murky, uh, inky blues that we used on that set. Um, and, um, oh my gosh, I've lost the train of the thread of the, of the question. So sorry. <laughs> so you were, you were telling us your, some of your favorite stories, how, how you were able to, um, uh, get to work on these films and, and then some favorite stories of costuming adventures. Right. So I, I was working on the elephant head in, um, on Moulin Rouge and, and then I happened to just be on set when Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor and Baz Luhrmann and, and all of those amazing actors came in looking just spectacular. And they started rehearsing on the, the song that they sing in The Elephant Head. And I just got to sit there. And this is before I had started really, you know, being a costume designer. I was just um, studying still. Um, and I got to be there as my first real taste of, of what it was like to be on set with such magnificent talent. And, um, and that was one of my favorite memories. And, and Baz Luhrmann is like, he's, he has got energy for, you know, the universe. He could, <laughs> you know, he could push the whole world and turn it around with his energy. He's just extraordinary. And uh, of course, all the actors that work very, very hard for him when when they're working together sort mm -hmm. of f feed off that energy, and it's just got this amazing kind of creation to it. So it was a lot of fun to to be able to be involved with that. So the the bug the bug bit you, and and here you are today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and um, yeah, here I am now working on my next project, as I said, which is set in the forties, and. Uh, uh, it's going to be a beautiful show. Um, it's called Transatlantic, and um, yeah, it's. I'm just having so much fun because this one, I don't have to copy what anyone's worn. I can just play and make up mm -hmm. what what um, what these beautiful people wore. And I mean, some of them are just really raggedy and scruffy, which I also love because I love. Um, the aging process and the and the patina that is, you know, rubbed into the fabric to create all this life that has happened and um, with dirt and sweat and years of use, which is is something I really love as well. History and clothing. 
Now let's let's take that thought a little further. You are known for authentically building character through costume, and you kind of started down that road. Would you talk about that a little bit more? Oh, I love that I'm known for that. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you um, might not have known, but you are. <laughs> well, I think that um, that probably comes from unorthodox, which um, was a really fantastic story for me to be able to be involved in because it not only was it a universal story that sort of got to everybody's heart because it was so easily easily relatable, um, but it also took us into a world that is not really open to everyday life. So the very it's a very closed um, Jewish community called the Satmar community, and they live within Williamsburg in New York City. And many people go, oh, yes, yeah, I saw them all the time. Yeah, I see them all the time. I go into the deli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you actually ask them about what the Satmar community are, they don't really know. So it was really fantastic to to do research on it. There's not very much um, online or anything because uh, they don't use the internet and they don't advertise their shops. And um, I actually had to literally go and spend two weeks in Williamsburg walking up and down the streets, talking to anybody who would actually talk to me. And, mm-hmm. and let me tell you, I stick out like a sore thumb. I'm five foot ten with short blonde spiky hair and red lipstick <laughs> mm-hmm. they, they noticed you yeah and mm-hmm. not everybody um welcomes me like quite a lot of men would take their hats off and cover their faces so they didn't have to see see me um but occasionally I'd meet someone who was inquisitive and would talk to me and I could not for life nor money find how they structured those um, scarves that they wear because there's obviously something underneath the scarf. It's not just a headscarf tied around your head. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out what it was. So I had to stop a woman on the street and just say, I really love your scarf. It's beautiful. I'm very interested in the history of, of how that came to be and how you make it look so elegant. And, you know, I just basically Mm -hmm. um let her know that I was genuinely fascinated and then she very kindly but somewhat sheepishly told me how they built them and they're made to measure so that's why you can't buy them anywhere Uh there's one woman in the community you go to her house and she builds this sort of uh, foam base that fits your head perfectly and then that base goes over the bald head and then the scarf gets tied on top. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I couldn't. I, I I just was like, oh my god, how am I going to do that? And uh, and I couldn't recreate it. So I had to go away and just try with all sorts of different types of materials and just work it out myself. And and I think I did quite a good job. And I I suppose that I recreated that world in a way that was authentic and maybe. Maybe that's why I have that reputation now because I really did everything I could to to recreate everything I saw in the two weeks that I spent um, in New York studying the community, the wardrobe, um, and as I said, the sort of the little secrets that make people shine through, even though they've got quite a strict structure of clothing. There were still little secrets that made me go, "Oh, I can see." how this person wants to wear, you know, just to show who they are. So I use things like um, the odd um, very expensive scarf or types of jewellery. A lot of pearls are worn in that community. And so I just recreated it the best I could to show um, the characters but still sticking very much within the structure of how the community dresses. You know, you said you, you think you were successful. Um, you were nominated for an Emmy <laughs> and for, for this show, so I, I would say so. Uh, and you won the German TV Award for Best Costume Designer. I did. Um, so those two weeks were absolutely worth it. I'll say to our listeners, uh, if you've not seen Unorthodox yet, it is on Netflix. Uh, and definitely both the story and the costuming are incredible. 
Um, so you you do build character through costume. Thank you. Thank you. And there's there's a lovely little um, um, making of that actually Netflix put on the platform as well. So if you do watch it and then you want to see a little bit behind the scenes, it's a 22-minute little documentary. Um, and I, I'm in it and I talk about my process in it and the production designer. And we all, all the heads of department just sort of say, you know, what it was like recreating um, this world because you have to also something you probably don't know is that even though it looks like it's all shot in New York, of course it isn't. It's all shot in Berlin. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Uh -huh. Yes. So I had to actually buy all the clothes in New York because there's a very special way that they dress. Like in, in our society, um, men's clothing buttons left over right. And then there's uh, the men's clothing dresses right over left, the same as women's do. So all of the men's clothing, of course, had to be authentic because, you know, I couldn't cheat it in any way. It had to really be from those shops. Uh, so I was like bringing all these suitcases <laughs> and boxes and hats and everything back to Germany. Um, I couldn't afford the Strimals and also the Strimals, which are the big, huge furry hats, mm -hmm. take a lot of um, – I think they take about eight mink pelts to make each one. And um, I needed 45. So I made them all out of fake fur. And um, and then I won the Peter Award for um, No Animal Cruelty, which I'm very proud of. Indeed. Indeed. Now, I, I know our listeners are, are interested. I'm, there's somebody out there who is inspired to have a career just like yours. Um, what advice do you have for them? Um, well, it's a, it's a very long road to get, um, to the position that I'm in. It's taken me, ooh, a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I think I left, I left film school in 2000. Um, so it's 22 years that I've really been focusing on this career alone. Mm -hmm. And I think what I really think is important is observing but observing not only what people wear, because, you know, humans are terribly lazy generally in, in public. And so when you walk down the street, you don't really see fantastic clothing. But when you do see fantastic clothing, it's very important to notice what it is that makes it fantastic and how people are wearing it and why they're wearing it. And then to start, I think, thinking about the psychology and the makeup of each person. Um, so that you can tell your own stories and recreate characters from all the bits of information you've stolen from people you've watched. Like I'm a massive people watcher. I'll get on an airplane and I'll check everyone out and go, okay, so you're wearing your pajamas and you're wearing this and you're wearing that. You know? <laughs> and I'll really observe what they're wearing. And when I find someone that I, I just think that they've tried really hard to dress the way they have, I'll go, what is it that's fantastic about this? And then I'll try and, uh -huh. you know, steal that memory away for when I next need it. So it, it sounds like observation is key, but I would say listening to your story, that is mixed with maybe a dash of tenacity. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and that's, and, and yes, of course, then once you do start sort of moving into the world of um, filmmaking, you have to network like, like a maniac and um because there's a, a lot of other people that want that job because it's a really amazing job even though you sort of work so hard you don't get much of a life anymore um it is a fantastic job and it's very rewarding um so you have to just really network and go to all those parties and meet all those people and talk about all those films and do all your research and watch many many films so that you can see how other designers have worked and figure out who whose work you like and why and then figure out whose work you don't like and why and I'm constantly learning which is what I love about my job um, right now I'm watching the movie Belfast which is a very interesting film it's beautifully done in black and white and the the costuming is lovely it's very simple but it's lovely um and so I'm just, I'm picking it to pieces 
on a on a technical level, but I'm also enjoying being pulled along the story, which is through the young boy's eyes in a in a very um, war torn city. Um, so it's it's fantastic. It's fascinating. So I'm always always doing research. Justine, what's next for you? What's your dream? Hmm. Well, uh, I have a five year old grandson mm-hmm. who is my um, he's just so delightful. I just spent the weekend with him in Berlin, actually. And my, <laughs> this is my dream. Coming up after this show, I want to go on holiday either to the Greek Isles. I want pandemic to be over. Yes. And I want to swim in the Mediterranean or go to, um, I really like going to Sicily as well, and where it's very rugged and beautiful anywhere and just go snorkeling and play with him and just have some time out. <laughs> that sounds, and, and that will be coming up in a few months. Yes, hopefully this summer. <laughs> hopefully. And, and may, may your words come true about the pandemic. Exactly. Absolutely. Let everyone just take, breathe a sigh of relief and, and have, it, have us move on. Indeed. Um, we, we've talked about a lot, a lot today. Is there a question I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, just trying to think if there's anything that I thought was really amazing about me that I should tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, um, I really admire people that use their hands and keep the crafts alive. And I think that craft is something that, that as a human race, we're very good at. But as I said earlier, I do believe that humans are quite lazy. So I really celebrate all you wonderful sewers that use your beautiful hands and your eyes and create art every day. And um, I'm very proud to say that I, well, I hope that I'm part of your community. Um, I've only made one quilt that I did by hand. And I made it out of all the bits of wedding dresses because I, I used to make wedding dresses to um to you know support my children when I was younger um, and I saved loads and loads of pieces of silk and it's huge it took me three years to make absolutely gorgeous and um it's my one quilt masterpiece <laughs> <laughs> well, that we'll, we'll call it your first quilt masterpiece. I could honestly, I couldn't do another one because I did the whole thing by hand. Oh my! Yeah, and it, it, you know, I actually had to get glasses halfway through doing it. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so you were talking about the the community and and addressing the the people who are are joining us today. Yes. If any of them would like to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to to do so? Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, it's Justine Seymour Costume Design, and feel free. I know you'll go into a little separate box, um, but I, I always try and answer all of the people that reach out to me um, because I think communication is just very valuable and very lovely. And um, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Justine, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. It's been my pleasure, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, there you have it, another story about someone just like you, someone for whom sewing and quilting is so much more than a hobby. It's a way of life. It's actually a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to info at soandsopodcast.com or just complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our So and So Podcast website for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman. And I look forward to you joining us next time on So-and-So.